You're welcome to take that somewhere else, but we have to get started. Sandra, are you comfortable talking from there, and can you comfortable talking? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> Um, so you've sent us two documents, uh, a lot of documents, and I think we all have our docs documents here. So I, I, uh, last Thursday, I um, had Barbara send you folks what I would call the tax rate uh, recommendation package. And the first page is, uh, summarizes the backup uh, information that goes into uh, the calculation of the tax rate. And um, the recommendation is a town tax rate of 0.8062, which uh, the effect on um, the tax, this tax rate over last year's tax rate, it would be to um, have a $36.40 increase per hundred per hundred thousand dollars of assessment over last year. That's uh, just on the town side, so it's a fairly small increase in town taxes from one year to the next. The tax year, as you saw, as you see in your summary page, is comprised of three elements. It's um, the town tax rate itself, which really is a simple calculation of approved expenses divided by the grand list. The grand list is up by a little less than 1% over the 2022 grand list. And uh, the, it's, it's a simple function. The higher your grand list, the lower your taxes all things being equal. And of course, all things are never equal because your expenditures oftentimes go up from year to year, depending on, well, fuel costs, health benefits, personnel expansion, or contraction, things like that. Very uh, common sense things. So that first, uh, that first rate, we call it just the town tax rate. And that's a 0.7918 when we go through all of the calculations of what did what was approved at town meeting. The town approved the proposed total highway and general government expenditures, as well as a number of uh, articles uh, for fire and ambulance, for social service uh, agencies, and so forth. Um, all of that is factored into that town tax rate. We then have two rates which on a tax bill are called um, the local agreement rate. And uh, the one component of the local agreement rate is the veterans exemption rate. That stays pretty solid from year to year. We have roughly, or we have had roughly 10 veterans. Last year there were 11. And what that does, uh, what, what what the veterans rate is, it's an acknowledgement of service. The state of Vermont allows a $10,000 exemption of property, assessed property value for a veteran. And it also allows a town to give up to $40,000 of um, exemption to the assessed value of a veteran's home if the town votes it. And so at some point in the past, the town did vote for the maximum veterans exemption. What does that mean? Let's say that the assessed value of a property is $140,000. But if you are a veteran, your exemption is $40,000. So your tax rate is applied to $100,000 of assessed value as opposed to $140,000 of assessed value. Now, what does that mean to the rest of the town? That means we have to collect that, that amount of money. So that next calculation would be, how do we collect the $300,000? Because the state already has calculated into our grand list that first 100, 10 veterans times $10,000. So we have to collect then 
that $300,000 in assessed value that we allow as an exemption. And what that boils down to is spreading out um, $3,000 across the taxpayers or the owners of property. And in this case, that tax rate is 0 0.0015 gets added to the town tax. The next component of the local agreement rate is the uh, non-homestead contract rate. And again, this is voted on in town meeting every five years. We, we see um, uh, nonprofit properties come up to uh, for vote to be exempt from paying taxes. And we have seven of those properties in town. And again, we figure out their, the value of them is $588,200. That's their assessed value. We figure out, ah, we, you know, what aren't they paying? They aren't paying their non-homestead school taxes. And so the town has to go about the business of spreading out what the non-homestead school taxes would be on that assessed value of $588,200. And that's a little over $10,000. And so we spread that out over all of the other um, parcels in the town. And that tax rate is 0 0.0049. So this year, that local agreement rate is 0 0.0064. Last year, it was 0 0.0072. So that fluctuates a little, a little bit, again, depending on number of veterans, number of uh, exempted properties, and their values as determined by the listers. So we have a recommended total tax rate of 0 0.8062 for this year. <coughs> the state, you probably got to the last page, has set the school rates. The homestead rate is 1.8637. The non-homestead rate is 1.7390. So those two rates are added together, multiplied against the assessed value of any particular parcel, and that is what um, it, that is how we raise our taxes. Uh, we're responsible for collecting the school taxes, as you know, for the district. And uh, within a statutory period of time after the due dates, we send them a check. That's a summary. I'm not, I think it's, it, well, I would be happy to entertain any questions or any clarification on the information that um, I have provided. Questions, anybody? What do you want in the minutes? <laughs> just a motion for the tax rate. Yeah, that's I fine. Think some of this is just for our folks behind us, so they're not, they may not have the benefit of the package. So yeah, you just, know, that's. No, that was wonderful. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. It was a very good. There you go. Very clear, yeah. So it's, um, it's not rocket science, it's, real, it's mathematical, and um, Oh, I can further summarize what we're looking at What for homestead plus town tax. The effect between this year and last year of the total tax rate, that's the total town, including the local agreement rate and the homestead rate, it is $152.20 over last year's tax rate per 100,000 of assessed value. If it's a non-homestead, um, parcel, it's $103 over last year's tax rate per $100,000 of assessed value. Mm -hmm. So very clearly, if you're questioned, the town portion of that total increase is really quite small. Mm -hmm. Really yeah. quite small. I have a very basic question. What are the um, non-tax projected revenue? That's um, your grants and things like that. Non-tax projected revenue that's in the middle of the page on oh, page two. Oh, is that two. Article Four? Some of its raised by, by non-tax revenue oh. that would be your current use payment, your pilot payment. Those are payments from the state. So what the state does for every town 
is it provides a certain amount of money uh, for parcels that are in current use. If you're a current use parcel, what happens with that is that depending on your acreage and the current use program you are in, your assessed value is reduced by that amount of money. So the multiplier, the variable that the state assigns for a particular current use is then multiplied by the number of acres in current use. And that amount is that then reduces your assessed value. So for instance, if you have a farm and the assessed value is $250,000, I'm making this real easy, right? We don't want to pull with big numbers. $250,000 of assessed value, but your acreage and current use, uh, the variable times the number of acreage comes to 50,000, that $50,000 is that then reduces the assessed value to 200,000 and that's the tax rate. So because the state encourages properties in this program, it, it uh, offsets to a certain degree, it's not dollar for dollar, but it does send the town uh, money toward that uh, reduction in assessed value. And that is all part of the calculation of your grand list. So it is reflected in that grand list value of $2,066,000. Uh, we're using to figure our tax rate. So your non-tax revenues are current use payment, pilot payment, um, your town clerk receipts your state aid to highways. What kind of pilot do we have? Or like a, like the number 10 pond memorial hall and okay. old west church and their, their Kent museum is a pilot so any land owned by the any land or building and land owned by the state is uh, part of the pilot program and there's two levels of that it's just uh, like if you had a state forest here or and then it for instance, and the Kent Museum is another example of a state-owned building that is here in Calais. So we get money for that. I did not know the state owned the Kent Museum. I didn't either until I started to work at Calais. I was so surprised. <laughs> it seems like such a Calais thing. <laughs> And do you happen to know how our current use, like percentage of land in current use compares to other towns? I do not know that off the top of my head. Other questions for Sandra? Donna has one. So Sandra, this tax rate, is it raising exactly the amount of the budget? Or did you add some a little now? No, uh, there's there's no wiggle room. So the proposed uh, highway and general. Uh, the, so you wrote it to you, you you did it to the budget. I did it to the budget. That's the legal way to do it. So the town voted on a proposed um, on a proposed amount of expenses. So the select board publishes how they're go they believe the town is best able or should best spend their money. So that amount of money this last year was $1,565,089. So if you look in your town report, you are going to see the proposed FY24 budget. You're going to see the prior FY23 budget, FY22, and they, there is a total. And when you look at Article 4, it says $1,245,372 shall be raised by taxes and $319,717 by non-tax revenue, which we just uh, categorized. That comes to $1,565,089. Now, the town, the town report adds that up by a dollar. So it actually is. Uh, Instead of $89, it's 90 which is probably the result of an Excel spreadsheet 
uh, rounding up. We actually need to can't count on Excel for that and need to run the tape. But the one dollar is not. I mean, what we have to stick with is those two numbers there. Which brings me to uh, one little item of peculiarity. No. <laughs> one little item of peculiarity that the select board should be aware of. Those two numbers, the numbers that we just talked about, what we're raising in taxes, uh, in tax revenue, and the non-tax revenue absolutely match within a dollar, which is probably, I think it was 64 cents. Um, to the budget proposed by the select board. However, you will note that there is a number before that that bears absolutely no relationship to those two numbers, and that's that $1.9 million number, and that is because somewhere in the editing of the town report or the warning, a revenue number was picked up off of page, I can even tell you, I don't think. It was, off of page 48. So inadvertently, somehow or other, that number, which is the total of proposed revenues, was picked up in that Article 4, as opposed to the 1.565. Yes, on page, so that was page 48 on the lower right hand column. The number should have been picked up off of page 46. The lower right hand collar. So, I, uh, column. so uh, it's very clear. This is the language that the town has used for many years. I have, if you were interested in it, I have town reports going back for the last two years. That number should be that 1.565089. Oh, so, it, it, so it was just, it was just picked up. It, it, it's clearly a manifest error. It, you're, you're not, they never proposed a budget of $1.9 million, ever. They proposed a budget that is comprised of what you're going to raise in taxes and what you're going to raise in non tax revenue. Can I just clarify? It wasn't an editing of the town report. We printed what was sent to us by the select board. I was not here. <laughs> find how these numbers were just simply, it was just picked up incorrectly, but the intention is very clear. Non-tax revenue, tax revenue, if you add it up, it comes to your budget. That was the peculiarity that I thought was worth mentioning. You ought to put that in the minutes. I am beyond, I'm at a total loss of words. <laughs> I wrote, questions were answered. <laughs> By the way, Rose was not on that select word. <laughs> Thank you. Just so you know. <laughs> so do you need us to set the tax rate right now? Yes, I do. I, I would um, propose that this, a member of the select board make a motion to, um, for the 2023 tax rate to be 0 0.8062. And if that motion is made and seconded and passed, we will uh, be running tax bills tomorrow or Wednesday morning. All right, Rose, did, oh, let's make sure Rose got it. Okay, go ahead, Jordan. I think so slowly. Um, but the, so the numbers that we were just discussing in Article 4 were based off of the projected expenditures um, that the previous select board was, was budgeting for. But then 
in during town hall, the voters approved additional uh, expenditures. Um, uh, which select board, select board stipends, um, some the swim, program, right? the swim program. Yeah, yes. the swim program. Did those do those get? Yes. backfilled into the uh, into an adjusted rate of that one point or I guess the 1.565 sure uh, this, this is your summary page oh, gotcha. so on your page one we it's titled your page one of uh, your backup is called results of town meeting and you see your general fund and highway expenditure number the one that ends in 89 and then your amendment that shows Pardon. Your select board stipend, cemetery commission, Kellogg Hubbard Library, and nonprofit organizations, which also mm -hmm. included the extra four thousand dollars in the town report. It was thirty-one one, but it was increased by four thousand dollars at town meeting to provide um, Cal's Pond uh, monies to put what was handrails, handrails. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you also have the minutes of the town meeting behind that page one, so you can follow the discussion and see the motions made. But yes, your total approved FY24 expenditures approved by voters was $1,974,025.36. So when I say it's like off by 64 cents somehow, that the Excel did a number on your, on the budget. So that is how we're raising taxes to meet a, um, a net expenditure of $1,654,308.36. So that is total approved FY24 expenditures minus your non-tax projected revenues. And your net is how we derive your tax rate. The net, the delta, mm -hmm. the, it's not the sum. The delta is then divided by your grand list, and there is your first part of your town tax rate, your base rate, that 0.7998. Would somebody like to move, as Sanders suggested? Would you like to hear Rose read it again? I think I. I move that we set the town tax rate for, is it FY24? Say 2023 FY24 budget. It's a, it's a 2023 tax bill. That's how they're referred to, even though they fund the FY24 budget. So you would say FY20, you would say 2023 tax rate. I move that we set the 2023 tax rate at 0 0.8062. Second. Second. Discussion? Everybody ready? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. You have some more things to talk to us about. Uh, one, a very, one, one, what very minor, 1.7 million point to me. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, Toby Talbot uh, has really been sharpening his pencil and initially came up with a theme of damages or cost to repair um, the damage caused by the most recent flood uh, at $1.7 million. That was his first brush. Uh, he continues uh, on a weekly basis to look at that and it may, uh, be less than that, but when I went out to the bank, that was the best number that we had. So what I asked them was, we, we're going to need help. These are the damages we are projecting at the moment. What, what can you do for us? And what they did do for us is offer us a line of credit at 3.99% for $1.7 million with the um, Settlement on it before I want to say September 23rd, but it's actually September 11th that this needs. No, no, September 25th. I'm so sorry that this will need to be um, 
Signed. Signed and formalized. Uh, so the line of credit provides the select board with a great deal of flexibility. You're not taking out a loan where you're paying that interest, whether you use it all or not, because we're not sure if we will use it all. It, we're just not. Um, you will, we will work together to determine on a monthly basis, I think, how much of that line, and that would be on the select board's discretion, of course, how much of the line are we going to pull out? What are we going to pull out in August? Are we going to pull out 50? Are we going to pull out 30? Are we going to pull out 75? I haven't seen all the invoices. I, I, I'm sorry, I have been ill the last four days, and I have not been able to get in and get to uh, the invoices. I apologize for that. But the, what I would propose is that the select board would consider uh, each month as we are uh, spending FEMA repair money on contractors and materials specific to, that, to those repairs, how much do you want to draw from your line of credit? And then we are responsible for, for the interest on just that money that we draw. Um, there was a point I was going to make there. Uh, what I have, we use a software system that is, is for fund accounting. So what does that mean? It, it means that when we pool our monies, which we do, into one large account, it's what we call our operating account, almost all of the town's monies and the various reserve funds are in that pooled operating account. Now, fund accounting, the way we use our software and it's designed for this, is we account for each individual use of that money. So for instance, record preservation fund, we know we account for it every month. It's $27,000, it may not be that. Uh, the highway fund is $120,000, and uh, each fund has a number and is individually managed through the software. So what Toby and I have done is figured out exact, it, it's figured out what expenditures are FEMA expenditures that we want to put in Fund 97. That's your FEMA fund. So all, all overtime is going to be reflected in that fund. We reprogrammed the payroll uh, software so that FEMA, so that overtime is billed to that FEMA fund. Materials that are just being purchased for FEMA go into that fund. Contractors that we've hired are paid out of that fund. And our reimbursement will come into that fund. So what? why am I telling you this? Is because that's the tool that you will be able to use to determine how much money you want to take each month from your line of credit. How much, how much do we have out? How, is it $75,000? Perhaps you will want to draw that. And the reason why you may or may not want to draw it when you have that discussion is because we have a fund balance walking into FY24 of roughly $400,000. It is an unaudited fund balance, but we're going to be close to jazz. There were very, very, very few, almost really none, adjustments by the accountants. <coughs> so you may want to not draw right away from your, you may decide collectively, not, it's not my decision, it would be your collective decision, how much do you want to take out every month? Or do you want to just play on that nice fund balance for now to keep your uh, interest rate as, uh, or your interest as low as possible? And why, why do you want to keep your interest obligation as low as possible? Because FEMA is not reimbursing us for that. That is the cost of doing business, and it is we cannot, we cannot get that back. So it's, it will be a very informed conversation. The board will have a, be able to have a very informed conversation. You will see what your fund balance is. You will see what your FEMA per, FEMA uh, expenditures are, and then you will be able to make a an informed decision collectively as to what or if you will be drawing from your line of credit that particular month. 
So it's you're not walking in the dark. You have a tool. That's great. Yeah. I feel much better. Yeah. Actually. Me too. I, I mean, yeah. You, you you'll have you, you will have a, a really good tool. And so T Toby and I have had several conversations. What we're not doing is putting regular 40 hour a week time in that FEMA column because that's already built into our budget. I mean just you know just to clarify that. We've we've got that, we budgeted for that 40 hours a week. Our, our crew is working on more than 40 hours a week at this point in time. But that's not in there. We just, the extra that we did not budget for is going to be very clearly reflected in that fund. Questions? Sieber has a question. I just had a question about not <laughs> the work crew money, the 40 hour into FEMA, if they're working on FEMA projects. I understand we budgeted for their 40 hour week, but the work they're doing is outside of what they normally would be doing? That's a great question, and so here's how that works. We still get to, um, when the FEMA application is made for reimbursement, we still show every hour that FEMA work was done and we will actually be reimbursed for that. But from the standpoint of cash flow, what do we have the money for? What is our, what is our tax base? We want to know what we're spending more than what we anticipated we would spend. So the town uh, it can, can really be well poised and, ha and have a solid cash flow and, and get all the other bills paid as well. All right. Um, is the interest rate FEMA reimbursable? No, it is not. It is not. That's that. We asked that question early on, and that was very clearly not reimbursable. So that's why it was important to develop a tool. So you, mean, you, you really don't want to take two hundred thousand dollars out of your credit line and stick it in that operating account if you don't have to. And you might have to one month. I mean, that's absolutely possible. But if you don't. You want, to, you want to say that. I would, I, I, I would think that the board collectively would want to say that. <laughs> are, we, are we going to be paying it back like as we go? Or? There is no prepayment penalty on this line of credit um, that does, uh, let's, let's get to the point of law here. The select board can only take out a loan for a term of one year or less on its own motion, which is what we're talking about here tonight. Um, with, and this is only a line of credit open for one year. So what we are dancing a dance here to hope that we will be reimbursed by FEMA within that one year period of time. And you'll know more. There is a, we have our very competent FEMA people here right now, but there's been a meeting that our F a, is that what it's called? The RPA. RPA. RPA has been submitted, so we are well on the way to being identified as a FEMA disaster site. We will have a meeting with a FEMA representative where all of our expenditures, which are right now being collected and categorized uh, very carefully, will be able to present those, and then we'll get a reimbursement. Reimbursement goes through the state. It first goes to the state and then from the state to us. There's also a state component of that as well. We talked about that in our last meeting. FEMA will hit 75%. Uh, the state, uh, as long as your road and bridge standards are signed, and I, I understand through the grapevine that that's going to happen tonight and be certified, you'll get an extra 10% from the state. So. The net to the town of unbudgeted expenditures will, will be 15%. However, good question here, we're going to be reimbursed for every, every hour of FEMA work. So that, that 40 hours that's not over there coming out of your fund is going to be reimbursed to us. And we should all, you, you could end up uh, being in the black at the end of the situation. So I, I can't predict that. We don't have enough hard numbers yet, but it's not as, uh, it's not nail-biting time. It's my favorite expression. It's not nail-biting time at this time. 
So the the FEMA <coughs> FEMA FEMA disaster site status does that increase or shorten the reimbursement period? I mean the uh, anecdotal woes are that it takes years for FEMA reimbursement to finalize and, and finally tr trickle through. That has not been, that was not my experience in Irene when I was working in Worcester. Once we provided our documentation, that reimbursement was pretty, was fairly quick fairly to come. Quick. It was absolutely not years. And um, it has a much, much to do with how uh, information is collected and organized. And I can say that Toby is doing a great job if yeah. every road that he's working on has a file, every material that goes to that road is logged in, the uh, crew is logging in their hours and where they are. So information is being collected road by road. And when they come in, it sounds crazy, but they really actually look at the paper. Give me your file, let's look at the paper. Okay, this fits, this works, it adds up. So uh, I did not, no, I did not see, in my experience, it, it was not years and years. And it could be years and years because it's in a town that has maybe needs three or four years to make repairs because from what we understand, it's one and done. That, that reimbursement is, they come in, you ask for it, and you get it at the end. So if it's a three-year repair period, yes, it could be several years. If it's a repair period within less time than that, six months, eight months, you're gonna be able to uh, apply for your reimbursement. Now, according to Toby, I don't think he thinks it's going to take more than a year. But there are other, maybe, it's, it's, I don't know, like I came in at the end of the Curtis Pond conversation. I'm not sure exactly how that might, where that falls in this discussion. Not for tonight, clearly. Moscow Woods, that's another very interesting tricky site. I don't know exactly how that falls into this conversation just at the moment. When you say we have to be under a year, is that under a year from when we open the line of credit? <laughs> under a year from when we start taking money out? What uh, is that a year? It's under a year from when we open that line of credit. So uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. it. I mean, it sounds like funny money, but I can kind of anticipate somehow taking another loan for less than a year to pay off this loan that we took out for less than a year if our FEMA reimbursement is delayed it, because it's just not gonna match up with town meeting. And you know, it's it's up to the board of course, but it just seems that you wouldn't wanna raise taxes to, to cover that money when, it, when you could take out a loan to pay a loan off just to get you through you, you want, might want to not do that because it jacks up your tax rate artificially for that one year. Mm -hmm. So follow-up question to that then, would it make sense to wait to sign this until we're ready to nope, take they, out a... You, you well, have to we, sign by a certain time. They're but, holding that interest rate open for us. But we us. still have a month. Should we wait to sign it? Uh, you are. You will sign this and this is accepting the offer and uh -huh. then they're going to put the documentation together, the formal documentation that meets all the federal requirements, and they'll get that to us. Okay. And so let's see, the interest rate will remain in effect for a loan closing date on or before September 25th. So uh, we'll look at the numbers, but you know, you're gonna be closing somewhere in the next six weeks. Is it possible they'll lower the interest rate? We won't know that ahead, I, will we? I, I, yeah, I that's know. a gamble. Okay. I, I, I don't know. Okay. You mean the feds will lower the interest rate? No, no. I was just thinking that they might, that they're saying they'll hold this 3.99 interest rate until that date. I was just wondering if after that date it might go lower. <laughs> 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 
company for the different banks, or is this are the bank that we deal with? Or how does that this is the bank that we deal with. They have uh, all of our loans. It really yeah. was, for all intents and purposes, it was a call. I need $1.7 million. <laughs> and then there was an email that said, well, here. This so, is what we can do for you. I, here's what we can do for you. Now, uh, just as a point of interest, the last loan we took out was for uh, the purchase of a um, West Star, and, uh, and that was 5%, over 5%. So this is a loan that is much less than the land. Oh, no, I'm, I'm wrong. It's not for the purchase of the West Star. It was for our share of the East uh, Montpelier fire yeah, that's right. truck, yeah. and that was 5% plus, 5% plus. Mm -hmm. So this is a good loan. What do you say, guys? Are we ready to make a motion to authorize, I guess that would be me, right? I think you should I'd be, be the you. duly authorized agent mm -hmm. to sign this agreement on behalf of the town. Have you or the road commissioners had any conversation with Toby about uh, like the scope of work that's not getting completed because they are performing on regular uh, hours? You know, I'm thinking about like they're separating out what they're doing. So I mean, their time card had Friday, which would have been definite overtime day. They were working on putting the dump truck that's being taken back together. So that's definitely not BIMA, and they categorized it as not BIMA. But are they tabling other other work? Like yes. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And everything else, yeah. I'm assuming. Oh yeah. And all the other so. stuff they're supposed to be doing, they're not doing. Yeah. Is that going to affect and grants that we have outstanding? Well, we have with the road segments grant. <clears throat> I think we're still going to be able to do those because they've asked that we. After I, it's been a really long time coming up with like 40 segments. I've been asked to go back to like eight segments. Um, and so we're going to tackle a couple of roads that need some additional work that aren't really FEMA related. Um, and that is something we're going to do. Moscow Woods, as you mentioned, that giant hole will be filled Wednesday. Um, and they still need to finish it off. And there's some shoring down the road. But by and large, our, the road pieces are coming together pretty quickly. So um, with the... Uh, Kent Hill Road, there's a grant that we were actually hoping to put out to bid because we don't want it a French mattress. It's, it's a fairly intensive and requires a lot of big rocks that no one wants to haul. So we were hoping to put that one out to bid, but otherwise we should, we're hoping to get stuff up to snuff before winter comes as much as possible. Okay, can we have a motion? I move that we accept the authorize Anne. Yeah. Authorize Anne Winchester to uh, sign to accept the proposal for line of credit for storm damage repairs and expenses for one point seven million. Is it community bank? Yeah. Community mm -hmm. bank LA. Okay. I'll second. I, let me make sure Rose has got it. You all set Rose? Yes. Thank okay. You. Jamie seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. If I didn't say the interest rate in the motion, we should probably put the interest rate in the you motion. You did say that. Do you want to read it back to us, please, Rose? No. No? I think not. No. We all need the motion to authorize Ann Winchester to sign and accept the line of credit proposal from Community National Bank. NA. Community Bank NA. No national. Oh, yeah. See, I, I didn't write national, I just said it. <laughs> Community Bank NA um, at 3.99 percent. For 1.7 million. Yeah. Oh, you said that. Sorry. I didn't say that. Not. Yeah, but thank you. Got it. Okay. Thanks, Sandra. You're welcome. It's okay. It's good. Yeah, I'll take care of it. I'm just going to ask. I sign things. Yeah. I'll just put them out there. Oh, you're going to take it. Okay. Uh, where's my agenda? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jake. Yes. You want to spend some money? 
I want to spend some time. <laughs> right on <the> time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I have a proposal for um, the expenditures of the rest of the money that is left in the EMPG grant uh, after the purchase of the generator. And um, unfortunately, I just got uh, notified by our radio expert that, uh, you know, at first she said it all looks good, but then realized that we didn't have power supplies for the radios in there. So I just had to change that right before the meeting and add this in. But as a summary, I, um, what we had to do is, is shuffle things around, and so I didn't have time to print a hard copy of this, and so I wanted to have an open discussion about maybe how we should handle this. But the general premise of this is that these are ham radios, and uh, our proposal was to uh, outfit five locations in town with antennas and get three radios, as well as a couple handheld radios. Um, with the update that we need to spend an extra $200 per radio, uh, I, I talked with Nick Emlin right before this and we agreed that we will actually decrease the number of radios down to two, the number of locations down to four in town. Um, and that also then leaves enough uh, budget for installing a cell signal booster here. The, the issue with the ham radios is that only people with a ham radio operator's license can communicate on them unless it is a life and death emergency. So it is, uh, um, we thought that the cell signal booster at um, the town hall here would actually be of benefit to anybody that is sheltering here, whereas uh, the, so that would be in addition to the ham radio. So the five locations we were originally thinking for the antennas was the Maple Corner Community Center, the town hall here, uh, the East Montpelier, or East Callis Rec Center, the um, town garage, and the school, the Callis Elementary School. And so one of those locations will have to be omitted from having a, an, an antenna installed with the new proposal. Uh, and, and in addition, we would only have two radios that would, could be dispatched at any of those locations. And so I wanted to, to um, bring that up here and discuss you know, how we should go forward with the updated amounts and it is the opinion of the, anybody on this left board that we should go down to three antennas and then be able to buy an additional cell signal booster for a different shelter. Remind me what EPMG stands for? For the grant, it's the emergency management, I don't know the name. What was the P? I don't know. Okay. Prepare, I think it is actually preparedness. preparedness yeah. yeah, emergency preparedness grant, emergency management preparedness grant. So these so. radios are basically you're thinking about them in conjunction with having shelters. It for shelters and uh, emergency operations center, and so there's a number of uh, people on the emergency response or emergency management committee. Uh, myself and uh, Betty, who are in, uh, going to be getting our uh, ham radio operators license, so we can be operators. And we were going to uh, have uh, training sessions for anybody else in town that is interested in, in jo uh, joining and getting certified. You do have to take a test in order to, and it is fairly involved to become an uh, official ham radio operator. If you're, if you're dropping the antenna sites down from five down to four, which one were you going to eliminate? That is an open discussion that I, I, I think that we will. This was new information that I found that out. That would be decided by minutes. the emer emergency management team. It would be decided by the emergency management team, but we're willing to take input from the select board on that. Anybody want to offer input on that, on loca location? Mm -hmm. Curious how the rollout of fiber to town buildings kind of influences this. So are the radios predominantly for uh, communicating with, I guess, other members of the team spread out around? Other members of the team, but the, the, the primary road. goal is if in a extremely long duration power outage, when we don't have any internet, we don't have any power, and the cell phone generators run out of power, we will have no communication um, to the outside world, and with the ham radios, we will be able to communicate with the state Vermont Emergency Management 
headquarters mm -hmm. and be able to coordinate with our the towns around us who are on uh, who have ham radios to be able to facilitate mutual aid uh, or any other uh, necessary uh, uh, helping out a, a, in a long-term disaster. Do you know if Worcester has ham radios? No, I, I'm not aware of the, the surrounding communities and what their capabilities are. That is on the action item list for uh, one of the members of our emergency management team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a Calus resident who's very well versed with ham radio. She's done lots of search and rescue operations from California to, for, to Vermont, and she's very supportive of this. Well, it sounds to me like you're going to come back to us at the next meeting with a new, somewhat new proposal then. Yes. Right? Yeah. And so is, is the next meeting uh, determined what the, that date is yet? We have not figured out that yet. Okay. We There's were waiting folder. to see the results of various things that happened tonight. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'll let you know. We will. Um, any other questions for Jade? So you said two radios only? Two radios. It, it, they can only be used by someone who is a licensed uh, ham radio operator. Okay. And so it's it would be a mode of communication not to you know every person in town. It would be a mode of communication to facilitate communicating to surrounding towns and Vermont emergency management in the event of a long term outage where we don't have other forms of communication yeah. to them. I would, I just, just uh, one of the things I had thought all along since, you know, Sunday the 9th or whatever it was, is like, God, I wish we had been able to communicate with Worcester better mm -hmm. and probably Woodbury too, but especially Worcester because of the Worcester Road and, and people not knowing whether they could get through or not. And um, so I would really love to see this be coordinated more regionally. Mm -hmm. So that the you know if Callis is going to this trouble, um, that we know Worcester is also doing it, and mm -hmm. and Woodbury, those yeah. two in particular. And with these radios, you would be able to pick up uh, emergency response communications as well from uh, fire dispatch and so forth. Yeah. So we, we will be able mm -hmm. to to pick up that. And we're, we got the biggest antenna. The antennas is the the biggest thing for being able to. Yeah, send and, and receive a long distance. And so especially down here in the valley, we've got the longest antenna we can fit. But each radio, the power supply is $200 and the radio is $300. Um, so that uh, we want it to be strategic. And the radios can be moved around from location to location, but the antennas are mounted and wired into the, the facility. Mm -hmm. So that way they can be dispatched to the locations where we have emergency operations center or shelters um, where we can coordinate communication to the outside world. Great. Fantastic work. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Is there, oh, sorry. Is there a significant difference between um, having it here versus having it at the uh, town office? Well, we would want it to be, uh, we thought it would be make sense to have it here because we are thinking the radio uh, operators center would be just on the other side of the kitchen where then we can communicate with people that are running the shelter, what our needs are and so forth, and where this could also be an emergency operations center and we wouldn't have to travel and it could be co-located with the, uh, the actual location of the shelter. Playing devil's advocate and, and expecting people to take issue with a 150 foot antenna being installed on the back of this building. It's an 18.5 foot antenna and it's going to be inside the cupola. It will not be visible from the outside. Oh, okay. What's the 115? Uh, That's the coaxial cable coaxial. to run all the way all down, way down. Yeah. all the way down to where the radio operator is. Yeah, he's totally climbed up in there with the bats and stuff. I did. You did that in these callets. I was like, ah. <laughs> Gotcha. Committed. Well, thank you for clarifying that. That makes a huge difference. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and also the, the proposed location of the East Montpelier Rec Center, the uh, antenna would be inside the cupola there because that's a historic building. But we sure. assumed that we could put it uh, externally mount, mounted on the back of the Maple Corner Community Center 
and uh, the the town garage and the school we could mount it on top of the building because it's not a historic building. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Jake. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Marge and Colleen and Jamie, let's talk about Curtis Pond mm -hmm. RFP. Mm -hmm. Can I come up a little closer? Yeah. Yeah, please do. Yes. <laughs> Colleen, you too. Come on up. Just this my ears are going. Come on up. You guys come on up. In the hot seat. Okay. <laughs> you want to explain the issue for the benefit of these folks? Um, do you want to go? Um, or Jamie, Boy, I whoever. I'll let Jamie. I just, <laughs> yeah, so, I'm not feeling 100% tonight. Yeah, yeah. So the I basis is we've been working um, in, in some cases the town, in some cases the CPA, in some cases both together have been <clears throat> working with uh, the engineers at D&K for quite a few years um, because the town had hired them to do an initial um, draft proposal of a dam, when was the original one? 2013. And, and initially um, 2003. Uh, the last select board went with them again and signed a contract with them um, to do this next phase, which was create the uh, bid ready drawings, engineer the dam, all the specs, all the details, uh, and get it completely ready to go out to bid. Um, and there, permits. And through the permitting process and every, everything we've done so far. Um, and there was confusion, um, which was really just a, a lack of communication and, uh, you know, looking closely at all the details of the contract the last select board uh, signed. But the contract that we're currently in with, with D&K ends now with the RFP ready to go out. Um, and so they provided us with a, an addendum uh, to that contract uh, to take us through uh, completion of the construction. Um, and so that amendment um, is broken into three pieces. One is 6,950 for um, managing the RFP and bidding process and helping us with recommendations uh, to decide which contractor to go with and helping with uh, development of the contract. And then there's two phases of construction uh, assistance that they're proposing uh, the contract cover. Uh, one is 44100 for just a lump sum of construction administration. Um, and then additional 38450 um, for oversight of the construction process. Um, so the total for this amendment is 89500 Some of us, when we first saw it, were like, wait, did we know about this? What? Uh, we sort of thought that, based on conversations with them, we sort of thought that the original contract covered all of that, um, but going back, it didn't. Uh, however, that sum of money was always included in the total budget for the project. So we're not looking at $90,000. I mean, we don't have final numbers on the project, and every time they give us estimates, they're a little higher because construction costs just keep going up. Um, but this is not new money. However, the CPA has had some conversations <clears throat> about splitting this out. And I was hoping Michael uh, would be here tonight. He thought he initially said he couldn't be and then he said he might be and he's not on Zoom. Um, so we, we've been talking about uh, having them cut this into two different amendments. Um, and initially signing a bid phase services amendment for the 6950 
um, and then having a larger conversation. Um, there's there's pros and cons. We theoretically could decide to go out to bid um, and and invite other engineering firms to bid on the work of overseeing the construction. Um, that they would argue, and and I sort of see that there's benefit to having the the engineers that designed the dam be the ones who oversee the project and uh, certify that it was done to spec at the end of the project, uh, which is something dam safety will need to sign off on at the end. I, I think there's value in having that conversation. I'd like to have a meeting with them um, at some point in here in more detail. Um, they, they laid on pretty strong the benefits of, of them uh, seeing it to completion. Um, I, I see both sides. I, we've had conversations and I feel like gone back and forth, but i um, curious what others think. So we, we could basically decide to sign this amendment um, and, and contract them for the remainder of the project, or we could decide to ask them to split it out into two amendments and we could you know vote tonight or next week or when we meet next um, to do the first one and talk more about the second but i guess i'd be curious if either of you want to speak to a preference and then oh, i did want to point out that um one of the i think my i'm leaning towards splitting it into two the first one uh, this almost seven thousand dollar one to get the RFP out and contracted. Um, one of the advantages of that is if we have someone lined up, we know who um, who will be doing it and might make a difference on um, and what the cost is. It might make a difference on what the overseeing. Um, engineering firm might charge. Plus, I think a little competition. I think if, if Du Bois and King think we, they've got it locked in already, I'd like to see some competition to maybe they sharpen their pencils and give us a better price for the overseeing part. But I would like, I think it's important for us to get the R. Oh, we, we were planning on going August 1st to put the RFP out for the dam for the construction, but because of this issue and, and with, all, with the flooding and everything, we wanted to have a little more time. But I would like to get that RFP out as quickly get the, and see if we're even gonna get anyone to bid on it as, and know what the price is. Right now, we just kind of got this number out in the air and we don't really know for sure what it would be. So I'd like to try to move to get that RFP out as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And if we just do the first part and then discuss this, the, uh, the phase for overseeing. So that's my, my opinion. So okay. I, I feel you very know. much like Marsh does. Uh, I think who bids it and their level of experience. And then when we talk directly to them, is the oversight somewhat of a formality? You know, just a, you have to have a license there. You have to have someone that's alive. Or do they rely on a lot of input from the engineers? And if a very experienced dam contractor said, if you could get someone for half the money, that's just fine, because mm -hmm. we know what we're doing here. Well, so, uh, sorry. yeah, we just, we really want to go out to bid so that we have some realistic okay. uh, uh, numbers. And I would, li I would like to see it separated. Okay, Ann had a question. Oh. Are they amenable to doing that? I mean, I, I thought it was very uncool to like the night before the RFP is supposed to go out to be like, oh, hey, so like 90,000, please. And, right. and again, if we get a competent contractor that has all those things that they would be, I don't know, it just it seems like an insane amount of money. And I hear you saying that it was part of the overall protection, but it kind of 
feels like it kind of came out of nowhere. And it's always so, been a percentage of like back in the day when it was a six hundred thousand dollar, then it was you know half that. It it it, it snuck up along the way. It tends to be point right. And two in two thousand thirteen, it was like thirty thousand. Yeah. So because it was ten percent of the. Construction costs, the estimated construction costs, which were what, almost three hundred. Okay, so this was like an expected cost that just we. It went because every time we get an estimate, it's a hundred thousand dollars more than it was a year ago. I mean, it's jumping at that rate. Okay, but I just feel it was kind of sprung on us. We're being held hostage. And I <laughs> but we do agree yes. on maybe going out to bid on that part. We just think going out to bid on the seven thousand thing that would delay it by perhaps months doesn't make sense. We want to get some realistic numbers. I always remind people, a Richmond Dam went out to bid and nobody bid on it. Right. I mean, how many people do you know need a contractor to do their kitchen and they can do it in 26, you know? So we want to know the reality of the situation as soon as possible. And, and so find I, someone out. I'm, Jordan had a question. Oh, just a minute. Not so much a question as more of kind of a statement. I, I mean, I think it, it, it's important to kind of recognize, that, to your point, that that $89,000 is likely tied to a percentage of the cost of the project, and, and that does get built into that, and that's fairly customary for you know an architectural firm that is going to be overseeing the construction of a house that they have designed you know you can you can opt not to have those services and then you're working with the contractor through all of those things we're not talking about a house or uh, or uh, a kitchen or really anything not to belittle anything it's just that this is you know fairly specialized construction and even if we do have a, a really awesome contractor n nobody in the community is then going to likely have the expertise to hold them accountable to the plans the um, won't let you. You, have you have to have, have, you have, to have somebody um, licensed yeah you know approved by the state yeah so i, I do i do agree um with with you know wanting to get the rfp out there and and trying to split the services i i can see where dnk are going to add a lot of efficiencies because it's their their plan and, and without enough experience around it, it, it seems unlikely that another <coughs> firm would be as competitive because they're going to want to run through they're going to run through the, the program and the plan and verify things that that DNK wouldn't otherwise do because it's because their plan it's their proposal but. Um, but there's no, no reason to do it. But I, I think it would make all of us feel better, if, or at least on the CPA, if we felt like we were getting the best price mm -hmm. um, for that aspect. And DNK is a big firm, which has some added, you know, in, uh, what the prices are, as opposed to retired, you know, civil engineers from the state that are, are acting as consultants, doing the same job they did when they worked for the state. but. At, without the overhead of a big company. I so wonder, we don't know what that difference is going to be. I wonder in if, if in that bidding process, well, I mean, we also got to, I guess, run the risk of of it getting more expensive. Um, if, we, if we go out to bid while the project costs then go up and every firm is then saying, okay, well, we'll do 10 or five and a half or or right. nine and a quarter, uh, or something like that. You know, they're they're all going to be running around the same numbers. Yeah. Um, it makes me wonder if we take this opportunity to work a, a not to exceed. If the dam designs are are not changing, but the uh, prices are going up because material costs, operational costs, etc., that doesn't necessarily change the scope of work that they would be doing. Um, those are just the real costs from the contractor, which it's everybody kind of understands. So, um, I mean, buying ourselves a little bit more time to uh, negotiate around that, but I think working in a, a not to exceed uh, price uh, for any any of the contractors or any of the firms that would be ha handling the engineering, I think that's um, good. because we don't know how long it's going to take to initiate. Go to Gabrielle's question. Oh, yeah, so my question is just mechanically, this amendment is for the full amount, bro broken down into three, but this is for the full amount. So we would need another one drawn up if we were right. separating out the 7,000, and mechanically, could we authorize you to sign that? 
And so we don't have to wait until the next select board meeting? Uh, I would hope so, yes. It's um, one, one other question on my mind about separating it and going to, if we decided to go to bid on the construction oversight, is the optics of having both aspects of the project out to bid at once. And I don't know if that how that would be, right? Like, if somebody's going to be more likely to bid on the dam construction, if they're like, oh yeah, the engineers who designed it are on board, they're continuing, they're seeing it through, or is it going to look funny to potential bidders on the dam if it's like, oh, they have a bid out, I'm not going to lock in construction if they don't even have an engineer. I just, I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know just if that would be invisible to the bidder or not. Why, why would the bidder know that, that well, both the town and Cal would be out publicly? Well, I think we were thinking that the RFP for the oversight would not go out until we had the contractor. Okay. Might, might that not slow you down a right. lot, though? Because right. when I, we, there's no, we can't start construction to the June 1st of the year. Mm -hmm. So we can't even, we won't be able to start till June 1st. So we thought of them as sequential, not but not just I, I just worry about the optics of negotiating a contract with a contractor without having a yeah, they might engineer in place. Depending on who's the engineer, so. um, I, I don't I'm think just sort of thinking this through with you. Yeah. yeah, and on the 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 new addendum, are, are they lump? Are they Lump sums or are they time and materials? I can't. Um, is there a not to exceed? No. I can't remember. I know. So, it's a lump I know. So they're fees, no. project fees. Task it's a lump sum. Task 10 are lump sums. Yeah. Task 11 is budget amount rate schedule. So that's a um, potentially flexible number. So could we do this? Could we? Um, Go ahead and authorize at least doing the first part and getting the RFP out. And put the rest of the discussion off until the next meeting, at which point we could decide to just go ahead with do Boys and King or not after you guys have had a little more time to think about it. That's what we had hoped we, for after and, and including a meeting with the engineers yeah. to understand the process for them. So right. you would tell Dubois and King we're ready. We certainly want you for the bid phase. Maybe we want you for the other phase, but we have to think about it a little more. And I think there's other, I think they're confused on, on what's what at this point too. So I got an email from Michael this morning um, saying we, we got contacted by Angela Rapella, who right. is Army, Army, Army Corps. Army so that's part of the permitting phase. Right, which and she was requesting more information. And Michael said, so are we still under contract with you? Should we be working with this? <laughs> well, that's under or the contract of getting our permits, which we well, don't have yet. But, the, right. but it's, it's creating confusion on their side. He's also work. new because the engineer retired. Right. Jeff Tucker retired, but is following through this process, but not all the way, because Michael's doing all the legwork. So I, I think they're the, in transition. The, right. in, the confusion for the Army Corps of Engineers is how has this flooding event affected our permit? Not necessarily who the engineers are. It's very, con it's very, it's in the contract that they're going to help us with the, with the um, permits. But now the Army Corps engineer is asking for what's, what, whether you need to take now into the flooding, what happened to the dam into account to issue the permit. Does the design need to change? Does the design need to change? Huh. And that's... <coughs> oh, it's... Uh, it, no. I, I, I think it's that... It's a huge wrench in the works. Yeah, I, I, my, my thinking is evolving a little bit over time in discussion, but I think I'm more and more leaning toward, you know, the reason we went with D&K for this latest section is 
because we decided at the time it was more disruptive to change horses even if we had reservations. And, and I'm sort of feeling that way too. If, it, you know, suddenly they're thrown in this lurch of which pieces are we doing, which are we not, and and well, it puts out this. I don't know. You lose some cohesion in the project. Like, how much is it going to cost to get a new engineering firm? I don't know the answer, but how how big of a thing is it to get a whole new? But the engineering owner? firm would only be for the construction, not for the design. We've already contracted yes. B and K for the design. The question is, do we need to change the design because of what happened to the dam during the flood? And then they'll know. And 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 you're thinking. And it opens that just has opened a bag of worms because do we have to do this dam safety right now has issued our. They're, they're issuing the permit based on the original design for before the, do we need to then go back and do something more? I mean, it's, it's just... Have you had that conversation with Michael Hildebrand? No, we haven't had that conversation um, yet. Well, we did, there was a conversation and the problem is it's been a very... We, because we were so close to putting the RFP out, we talked about whether or not we should add to the RFP the scope of the work, removing the riprap buttress and any repair face work. And they recommended that we not add that into the, the RFP right now because we don't know exactly what that's going to look like and that it would be better done as, a, as an addendum to the um, and contract I, once I we have contract. I think that's what DM Safety was kind yeah. of doing too, that we were kind of going along with what we did, what it was like on the Saturday before the flooding and we're pushing through on that and then do addendums when we figure out Right. what needs to happen. But it, it does cause a lot of confusion because do we need to talk to the Army Corps of Engineers and say, pretend none of this stuff has happened now, we're going forward as if, you know. But, but that's the question they're asking you, isn't yes, it? Yes, exactly. Yes, and, so you just and said under Army Corps, Corps of Engineers is historic preservation, and now that, that boulder bustress is one more huge adverse effect. So we don't, that's a permit we don't even have in hand and they didn't have that piece, and now they have that piece, and they're saying, well, we have to hear from the engineer how the design's gonna change so that we can comment on how much of an adverse effect. So uh, there's, you know, I mean, there's too many variables for the uh, equation to be solved. I, you know, right. I mean, I think it's, it's been a frustrating process for everybody because there's so many moving parts. The flood changed a lot of things. There have been a lot of unforeseen delays. And I think we all share some frustrations with the process and we had some disappointments in timing disappointments of the permits. In, we in, were not aware of a certain permit that we needed till right. much the, later than it could have happened in a time of right. Right. Which, which one could say, did they withhold their, their, their part of the uh, uh, contract there? But, but I think we should be cautious and just think through, are we, is, is the thought of going out to bid on this last phase coming from, like if we make that decision, we have to separate out are we making that decision because we really think we'll get a better project, better product or a better price? Or are we doing it because we have some frustrations and, with the... And I do want to say, we, I am concerned if we don't get someone lined up, soon we will not get someone right. lined up. Yeah, but did I hear you say that we might actually have to change what we would be putting out to bid because there might be some more damage no. to the dam? No, no. we, no. we asked them that, that question. Okay. And they said that it would be better to go out to bid with the current plan and if changes have to be made Put, later, do, an add -in to do it, it add -in. Okay. later. So why can't we go ahead and, and accept the first, ha the first bid or whatever, the first piece of this, the, 
Put out seeing, the bid uh, ASAP. Um, yes, that's that's what. And um, you guys yeah. continue the discussion in terms of where we go yeah. next and come back to us. That's what I. That, okay. I think that's what we all want at this point. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm so we are afraid I've, of losing momentum. And, right. I have yeah. reservations that not just doing the contract will delay things further. I know, but I worry that with the contract, but, it sounds like they want you to do things that we're going to be paying more for things that they've already we paid them to do. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we've done that. That's, that's, not, that's, not, that's, not, that's how we that. felt at first, because yeah. we misunderstood what the original right. contract was. And it turns the, out it was in the, the bottom case. line anyway. Right. 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 And so, yeah. But it wasn't until we didn't, it went from around 30,000, as far as for the oversight, about 30,000 to So that eight. part grew. But like with him questioning whether he could talk to the poor Roman engineers, would that fall under permitting? Yes, it would. He just, you know, he's seeing this and saying, we've just been going ahead assuming we were going to, you know, sign on the dotted line as a, you know, technicality. Mm -hmm. We've all been talking all along about they're doing the whole thing. That's right. been the assumption of both parties all along. And I think it was, you know, on, on both parties to not see this coming. They certainly should have told us before the day the contract ended. <laughs> um, well, they have told, they have kind of, the thing is it wasn't very, it wasn't very blunt. It was, yeah, it, it only, you know, it's in the contract and, and you know, but it wasn't like yeah. you will have to pay more for the RFP. So, so could, I, I don't want to make it sound like they didn't tell us. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so, okay, could somebody make a motion Let's see, Jamie, why don't you formulate a motion for us? So it's, <laughs> it's seeming like, I feel like before, I, it seems like we're leaning towards wanting to not sign the whole amendment. Yeah, so the motion would so be to authorize to, you. Right, to ask. Du Bois and King to s draw up a new contract amendment, including only that task just nine. covers task nine. Yeah, and authorize me to sign it. Authorize you to sign it and authorize release of the bid. <laughs> yes. When we we had August first, we now changed that. Do we actually have to vote on the date? How about release of the bid as soon as possible? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And no later than September first or August fifteenth. Okay, August 15th. August 15th. okay. Yeah. Rose. Let's, let's do that, that again for it. Rose. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone made motion to authorize Jamie to ask Du Bois and King to draw up a new contract to a new contract addendum. A new contract addendum. For just covered. task nine. For the what? For just task nine. For just task nine. Task nine is one of the tasks in the ad addendum. Just in the, in the addendum. Yeah, because there's a task. There's task numbers in the original, yeah. so it's yeah. good to identify what the document is. So we're authorizing Jamie to ask them to draw up a contract. Um, authorizing just task nine and release of the bid as soon as possible. And we are further authorizing Jamie to sign such a contract. Is it contract or contract addendum? This one contract we got was contract addendum. Yeah. And further authorizing Jamie to sign. Actually, can I just clarify, they actually called it contract amendment number one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> amendment. amendment and not addendum? Yeah, yeah. Contract. It's amendment. Oh, yes, they did. Yes. Amendment. <laughs> contract amendment. Oh. Yeah. Amendment. Yeah. Amendment. Yeah. Amendment. Yeah. Sometimes my cursor just like does what it wants to do. I don't even know where I am. All right. And or 
Amendment. 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 Number one. Text number one. All right. Ask two boys to drop a new con a new contract over at CIO for contract amendment number one and release. No, what about the task number nine? Uh, that is get rid of that? No. no. You want uh, task number nine in the amendment. Uh, two number one. Eight. Including task no. No. for only, only tax for number only task task number nine. nine. And release of the bid as soon as possible and further uh, authorizes Jamie to sign that? Yeah. There you go. Do, do you want to put a no later than as soon as possible and no later than? No, because why would they drag it out? Yeah. yeah. Do we do you need to put in the resolution using the already agreed on our P things or something like that? Or that we've already reviewed and all that. We don't need that. Okay. So I, I just Is before we right? before, let's get a second. Right? We yeah. got we got a motion on the table. Well, we don't have a, we don't have a motion on the table. She she formulated a motion. I move that. Okay. You make that motion. Yes, I'm making that motion. Thank you. Would somebody second, please? Second. Okay. Now further discussion. I I just um, I am also concerned about trying to like do this tough talk thing, like, you know, for, to try to assert that we're on top of things or whatever, you know, like kind of just acting, um, I don't know what might be against our best interests in having them manage the construction. And so I want to make sure that we have a time frame in mind for making a decision. And, um, and, and honestly, like, I just, you know, now that we are, fully entangled, the Curtis Pond Association and the select board. Um, I don't, you know, like, do we have to count votes or like, how, how does that, how are we going to do that? Do, do we just keep talking about it until we come to a mutual decision? Do we want to have the four of us have a meeting with Michael and Jeff? Yes. I think that's I think that would be wise. I, I think we, to understand the process a little better, yeah. Uh, I know because Jeff always used the language in the next phase, if you choose us. Right. And I don't think it was completely mm -hmm. uh, right. assumed, but I also completely understand your point, Jamie, of the simplicity of moving forward right. with that. I totally get that. And nobody wants to shoot there. And we're all in the boat together at this point. And uh, we just want to move forward efficiently and understand what we're doing. Is it is it reasonable to ask that they I guess come to the next meeting with this split amendment so that we can have a direct conversation uh, about the task ten and eleven and you know and express our concerns about even if this does go out to bid there's no guarantee that we're we're going to get a contractor and we either need to go out to bid again um, and costs go up so i wonder if they'd be willing to address our concerns about those last two items continuing to increase in price even if designs don't change and if they'd be willing to to accept terms around uh, not to exceed on those on those amounts, then you know I think I think everybody would be a lot more comfortable, and I think that plays into the conversation, the kind of the tenor of the conversation um, to to this point. We're, we're we keep running into delays, we keep running into things that draw it out, and the costs continue to go up, and those drag up all of the other costs with them. If they'd be willing to assume some of that risk. Uh, uh, and, and and put a not to exceed on on tasks ten and eleven. I think everybody would feel a lot more comfortable committing to that that entire number. Is that a fair representation of? I'm just of concerned it's going to keep climbing. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. That's why and we could incorporate that. It's going to be a little this and a little that. Four-way yeah. meeting that we have with them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's all a good point. 
and we'll keep that in mind. Could we and have I, a not to exceed? Okay, I'll put it on the next agenda, and if you can't pull it together by then, we'll put it on the one after that. We have, uh, we've tentatively scheduled a, a meeting already. Oh, remember if you said availability, or we're on what emails. Um, but I there's did, been I discussion of a Wednesday, Wednesday morning. morning. Okay. Okay. Oh, so travel. That, you should no. be able to do that quickly then. Yeah, we should be able to find a time this okay. week. Great. Can we leave this one then and move on? Uh, so we have to vote on that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, we I'm sorry. Vote. We have an amendment on the table. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, does anybody need it to be read back? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Abstain. Oh, yes, Jamie abstains, Rose. Okay. Because we're making her. <laughs> and you'll work on the timing of that meeting. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, goodness. How's everybody doing? So well, good. Okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe all the rest of you are all hanging in here. <laughs> okay, we're on the contract with, um, well, we'll start with Black um, Rock Coal Quarry. Um, Rose has given us a new um, letter of agreement, that's what we're looking for, to sign. Uh, you've all had a chance to read it. This is a letter of agreement with uh, between us and Black Rock Coal to open the quarry and charge us, give us, uh, allow us to put in a crusher and an excavator and all that, and to um, charge us six dollars a yard and allow us to stockpile it. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Take a motion then to sign it, and I need a clean. Copy. Oh, you gave. That's I two with Greg's signature. <laughs> oh, well, okay. We'll take those then. Are there any dates on this that say, like, specify, um, like October fifteenth, for example, which is the end of the crushing period? Uh, no. Okay. Except that they're they have to and there's no choice and we all yeah. know that. And it's yeah, it's elsewhere. Other state. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd make a motion to authorize Ann Winchester to sign the agreement between town of Callis and Black Rock Coal. Um, as as proposed. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Rose, will you make sure I sign that before you leave? Sure. <laughs> or you can give it to me now if you want. Okay, that's Black Rock Coal. Now we have the one between, uh, I'm not sure why you say Todd Dale contracting and T&T, &T, isn't it, with T&T &T equipment leasing? Uh, I don't know. So, I asked that question. So that was, uh, oh. that was my best effort to uh, capture Danielle's concern about there being a couple of different references, so uh, we can look. scratch that out and just make it TNT. That's what was on the uh, the bid. This. It was, and then the uh, draft two that oh, Toby had you. circulated. It, uh, Oh, well, that was just Toby's mistake then, I think. Yeah. You know, I think they used to have the contracting, and I think now they're doing the TNT. Yeah. It's like they've shifted to the... Uh, so there are two... Oh, the only other place that I worked it in there was in the addendum in terms... Yeah, you had it twice. Um, contract with Todd Deo, so I'd just take out that, and it'll just be... TNT equipment leasing. Okay. Questions for Jordan on this contract? Did you did you write the addendum? Uh, I just enhanced things, I guess. So it's very um, helpful. Uh, you know, I tried to capture the 
the tenor of the conversation uh, from our previous two meetings and the um, emergency meetings that we had last week. Um, so uh, the figures are all based on the same figures and rates that were kind of assumed in those conversations, but then just extrapolated out to get lump sums so that we could include some not to exceeds and then some additional language um, allowing or re requiring the town to approve any, any overages or adjustments uh, to the plan. Um, Uh, it actually, one of the changes was uh, invoicing biweekly, which uh, which was actually already in there. Um, so I left that as is, the, though I added remit information for the town of Callis uh, with email addresses uh, for the treasurer, because um, they're going to have to get set up as a vendor. Um, I added a note under the personnel section uh, to include, uh, so Toby had originally in there BOSHA and uh, FMCSA, which is the Federal Motor Carriers Safety Administration. Um, so that those were mostly focused on uh, contractors operating equipment um, safely, commercial equipment safely. Uh, so I also added in their obligation to make sure that the, they are operating within uh, the MSHA uh, guidelines, which I think would be appropriate for them, right? Because can, can you yeah. tell so the rest of us? They... MSHA is the Mining Safety and Health Administration, and they oversee uh, kind of extraction, oh. with, uh, okay. extraction operations. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be participating in the majority of the activity, so they should be responsible for operating relative to those guidelines. Um, the big kind of clarification was relative to equipment. Um, trying to find there's a, in, in the body of the agreement, there was uh, a representation of uh, minimum equipment. Mm -hmm. Where is that? Uh, uh, Article, Article eight. eight. Yeah. Um, so I just add a little bit of language uh, to get to the root of uh, what those pieces of equipment were. Um, so that would be the one crusher out of the three to start um, an excavator uh, equipped with. Uh, with a thumb uh, for general material handling and the excavator equipped with a hydraulic hammer. Um, the additional crushing equipment may be mobilized upon municipality's written request or, and approval. Um, sounds like everybody would be on board with that um, at the fees that were specified in, in the addendum. Um, so then I just added that fee structure to to the addendum so that it's very clearly associated with the mobilization of the minimum equipment and not to exceed three thousand dollars in total for those four pieces of equipment um, and then holding the contractor to the 750 mobilization fee for any additional equipment um, I have a question about ask about the three wrong questions Yes. I'm going to buy Amanda. Yeah. So is there like a definite schedule yet for uh, yes. hours? And if they're all free, are they all running at the same time? So that's a good question. And that was one of the big additions to the addendum um, that we haven't really run by anybody. So hopefully this kind of aligns with everybody's expectations. But um, technically, the um, the governor's executive order uh, waives conditions uh, oh, yeah, like that. that. And it's so we, so yep, so uh, we've added um, uh, terms of operations and scheduling uh, into the addendum that sets uh, production targets or production target dates. Um, 
uh, hopefully with um, site organization um, and some hammering. So right now the state of the quarry uh, needs to kind of be prepped to have one of the crushers come in. Um, so we're hoping that that can start this week, which is mostly just going to be excavators and loaders. Um, uh, and then the arrival of the crusher. Um, the by I'm August about hours of operation. Yeah. So I'm just asking. Yeah, like I'm fully aware of the activity that's going on over there. I just want to know. I rent my house out for the summer, and I have circulating tenants, so I need to be able to tell them like. Seven to it's five. Gonna be 12 hours so we're a day. we're proposing that crushing crushing activity and hydraulic hammer operation be limited to the hours between seven a.m. and five p.m. Um, and that that solid like because like there's been like the fifty truckloads a day thing. There's there was like none today. Like I, I totally get that there's gonna ebb and flow, and I don't understand if it's just gonna be solid about crushing all of those hours. So so uh, the, the coming and going of the trucks is a little bit uh, different um, because those are going to be independent contractors or town trucks that are, uh, that are bringing material out. Um, so I, I tried to make this so that we can kind of adjust to things as needed if there's um, uh, community concern or input or feedback um, while also trying to recognize the urgency of trying to make this as productive and efficient an operation as possible. Um, so the operations, this is just governing the operations of the crusher and the contractor who's gonna be doing the crushing and the, the hammering work. Um, and that right now uh, is limited to the hours of 7 and 5 p.m. Uh, the operation uh, should not exceed 10 hours per day. Uh, on any given day and uh, or six six days per week uh, without prior written notice and approval of the municipality. So that is the extent of the conditions that we added in there for scheduling relative to the crushing activity, which is going to be likely the most impactful from kind of a noise level. Um, I think the trucks are pretty impactful as well. And the trucks will be, but yeah. we'll likely need to have a conversation, I think, with Toby about how we're managing the outflow of the trucks because that's not necessarily going to be part of the crushing application. So we wouldn't, or the, the crushing contract. Um, Right, I mean, it does that. But it's also, it, the, but I mean, just thinking out loud, you, we may not be an, able to answer your question right now, but like seven to five seems reasonable for truck traffic, right? Because that's what's I've, happening that's, in Moscow. That's, it's, right. it's, that's yeah. between us and Black Rock Coal. They're the ones who have the permit that says how many trucks a day they can have. Yeah, they, there could be 50 truck trips a day, but I think we just don't know yet because it's such a new endeavor. Um, we, you know, I don't. There, I don't think there's going to be trucks hauling out of there until there's a stockpile of material. Yeah, and and I'm like I'm totally understanding of the situation. It's just really hard for me to be able to figure out how to communicate. And um, like I didn't get. I got the first letter, but and I only saw the thing on public form about the rock crusher. So I was just hoping to have more. It's brand new. No, I know. We, we I was got to notice how this. That's why I came tonight. Yeah. I, I mean, um, in our conversation he was saying it, the initial conversation he was expecting what four hours a day of hammering <coughs> well it's going to be like a little irregular and, and it kind of is but it'll come and go. yeah yeah so that's what yeah. i was expecting but then when i said you know I, I know there's that time so i just wanted to find out and i never heard that there was going to be three rock pressures well, I think there's only going to be one, right? Aren't they going to just make three? I, I think it's not like it's a possibility you could add it if needed. Well, well, we would. So it, it's best to think of it as like kind of like a screening process. So uh, the first rock crusher uh, is going to take bigger pieces of material and, and turn it into three and a half inch minus material. And then uh, at some point, um, the as the stockpile of that three and a half inch material is generated, uh, the town and road crew um, and the operator uh, will have to have a conversation about whether or not it makes sense to bring an additional pressure over to make the smaller material. 
Um, at, at, at any given time, I can't imagine that more than two crushing crushers or crushing units are going to be operating at the same time. There's a third one that is, that, that's a lot more specialized for making um, like much finer material that really isn't likely going to be used on, on our roads during the next couple of months anyway. And because of the short window of time that we have to make the material and use the material and get it applied to FEMA projects so that we can get reimbursed for the material, um, there, there may be kind of an incentive to, to just operate the one crusher in a, in a much more trunca truncated period of time to just build up the stockpile. And then you're just talking about the hauling of material out um, and, and setting a schedule for, for that. The, uh, kind of back to the hammering, we, we've been working on the assumption that we don't know a lot about how many operators the, the, the contractor is bringing over for the different pieces of equipment and, and whether or not they can be operating multiple pieces of equipment at a time. Um, so we knew that in the first week they would likely want to kind of front load a lot of the hammering activity to kind of prep material so that they can keep the crushing operation productive. Um, so that's the only reason I kind of initially steered away from trying to specify a certain number of hours a day for, for the hammering. Um, that may come down the road uh, if, if need be. Um, but I, I do, to, to your point, I, I recognize and also agree that the, the trucking as the stockpile builds is, is likely going to have the, the greater impact of kind of like coming and going. Um, and uh, we're, it's hard to define that in this particular, in this particular agreement. Um, oh, that's very helpful, thank you. But yeah, no, well, I, I appreciate you bringing, yeah. bringing it up. It's, it's not an easy conversation. And I and I am I, I was thinking the default was that it was going to be all three and a half um, because uh, that was sort of the first I feel like that was the first thing we talked about and this is assuming half and half three and a half and then one and a half which which would necessitate a different kind of crusher but this is but are, but is this written in such a way that we are just going to wait and see what makes the most sense. So that's the, the um, not to exceed numbers uh, that were in our spreadsheets. We're assuming um, we're assuming a 50 50 split between uh, the materials. So the way that I tried to massage that language is that the total material fees uh, not to exceed 10,000 cubic yards or uh, $97,500 mm -hmm. um, uh, without prior written notice or approval from the municipality. The total material fees assumes uh, 5,000 cubic yards of each material. The municipality reserves the right uh, to adjust these allocations as needed. Um, so I think if we determine at some point that um, it's the most efficient to crush all 10,000 cubic yards um, into three and a half inch material. Um, that's going to be cheaper than the $97,000 because the, the rate for that yardage is, is lower by almost half. Um, but that's going to kind of play into the road crews. The other thing is that that's likely also going to slow down the truck traffic a little bit because they're going to need time to produce that material out of the material that they've already processed. But um, that's, that's assuming a lot. Um, okay. Other questions on this? Yeah. yeah. Um, Jordan, could I get clarification? Did you wait early in that? Did you say for the purposes of invoicing, you are putting in the treasurer's email account? And the assistant treasurer. Okay. Okay. And the physical address. Okay, that's fine. Because Sandra works very part time and is in only maybe one day a week, and that would delay getting invoices off to the road crew for them to authorize them and code them. And that would definitely delay the whole accounts payable process if the invoices are going to her email address. 
Uh, would the road crew have anything to do with these particular invoices? Oh yeah, these are highway bills, right? I know, but I'm just I'm just trying to think how they would confirm. Well, I guess truckloads. Well, and that's any, any highway department yeah. invoices go to the road crew okay. to, to, them to yeah. authorize payment and to code it. Got so it. we went through a stack today from Menage and different pits, and that came in and went to different sites, and you got yeah. a this one hit there and that one there, and other questions, comments. So um, you've got in here that I'm the municipal li liaison. We need an alternate liaison. I, I think that's just for purposes of who he contacts. Is that, my, that correct? So who would like to be the alternate liaison? We have Toby. We already have Toby. Toby. Yeah. Toby. He's Toby. not here. Toby. 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 OK, we'll make it Toby. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there's the, the, contractor's the contractor's alternate is blank. The municipal side already says Toby. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah. Oh, silly me. There it is. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Um, then I'll take. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <It's not. laughs> I was just got to where it outlines the treasurer's email. Would it be your preference to take the treasurer's email off? And have it when go people to send an invoice to different email addresses to more multiple, we all start to take action on it, and it, we end right. up doubling. We end up duplicating the work. Right. So it's really cleaner if it's just one email address. Would that be a change we can make? Yeah, sure. No, we... Jordan, are you getting these changes? Yeah, I just changed it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, James. Yeah. So with those changes. Would somebody like to move the, you would authorize me to sign this contract on behalf of the select board? I move. So, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I just noticed there are two things to sign, acknowledgement of arbitration, so that's fine. I think if you just authorize me to sign this, this document on behalf of the select board. The only thing, and it kind of goes back to the trucking, um, as it's been discussed in all of the conversation so far, it, you know, it's paid. It's it's paid for the yardage produced, but we're not necessarily going to know what the yardage produced is until we load the trucks and the vehicles. And um, and so, I'm, I guess I'm just a little concerned about kind of the, the vagueness of what 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 initiates the uh, the payment schedule and the invoicing. So if in the first week we've got. Uh, like the mobilization of stuff naturally because that equipment's moving and then it's going to be performing work and then there's hammering and we have an hourly rate for that. Um, the invoicing, I guess, is going to be kicked off by BlackRock. As we, trucks are being we loaded. We have a conversation with Todd. Um, he measures it, um, and I'm not familiar enough with the process. He measures it. Don, Donnie, do you know anything about this? I, I do. You want to add into this? They're going to they're gonna keep the total of the yardage coming off by the loader that is going to stockpile. Okay. So the whatever size that bucket is, whether it's two, three, four, five yards, that's how your total is going to get. Every bucket full dumped. That's how. That's how you find out. So he'll know at five thousand yards when he's at five thousand yards because he'll have if it's a you know a three yard bucket. Yeah. That's how he's going. So, so I don't know what size the bucket. Is. So if they're invoicing every two weeks, then presumably we'll get one every two weeks for the amount of material of which size they've crushed. Uh, yeah, right. and my guess is that at 5,000 yards, we're probably going to have to make a decision if we want him to keep making right. just the 3,000 or just the 5,000 of the three and a half, or if we want to pivot and start another stockpile because that's going to be a, a different a different rate. Um, and then, yeah, okay. So it's an evolving conversation. Then. Okay, so we have a motion on the table to authorize signing of this after Jordan makes the changes we've discussed. 
Who is there? Motion. Uh, I started to. Oh. I move that we authorize Ann Winchester to sign the uh, Town of Callis agreement with uh, TNT equipment leasing to um, crush roadbed material in Black Rock Quarry. Do we have a second? Second. Yeah. Any further discussion? Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is there any other material going to be coming out of the quarry with the exception of the stuff that's being processed? So, like right now, there's. Is there anything shipping out of the quarry to the site? Can I ask one maybe naive question? Does the, if we end up bringing in the other crusher to make the finer material, are we using the three inch minus and crushing it more to get the finer stuff? And so if we're tracking, if we're paying a higher premium for the finer material and they're billing weekly for the three inch minus, are we double paying Aren't that? Aren't they just paying for what we haul out? No, they're paying for what they crush. Yeah, that's how they're going to track it. They're, they're tracking crush it as it comes off the it. crusher. But and the so invoice. If they're if they're billing yeah, us, yeah, I'm getting it confused. Yeah. It's a different the setup. answer is no. No, it's a different setup. It's a different process. Yeah. Okay. So one crusher makes one product. Two crushers. Crusher crushes first product into the second. Okay, crusher. so it's not using the same no. stockpile that we're trucking and then no. maybe recrushing. That's okay. why it's that's why it's more because yeah. it's smaller. Okay. Yep, and it will be because I know like Moscow Woods, they're going to be getting into the three inch before the yeah. stuff we're doing is ready. But so. something we have to run the the three and a half through through the second crusher at some point, so we'd be pulling from. One of the stockpiles, no, or no, 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 it right, it, it's from from the two crusher to second crusher to smaller product. You're not taking from so your stock that was already created. You're creating a fresh set to then make smaller. Yeah, you know, the stuff that was a whole set line. Yeah. Okay. You, you okay. don't take from the stockpile and then make smaller. You start from. Okay. Yeah, but at some point it sounds like we're going to have to make a decision whether or not we just want to keep. Turning through the, the, the three and a half, or or pivot to whatever's right. left in the quarry to make a stockpile of an inch and a half. I think the guys just want to be able to use what they want to be able to use it up for FEMA purposes. So we're going to need a mix because pragmatically, by the time they get going, a huge chunk of that three inch is already going to be pulled from somebody else's quarry. So. I mean, we've got plenty of roads to fill with it, but they're going to need the smaller stuff, too. So do we need to sort of depend on them to come back to us or maybe the road commissioner about when we need to authorize? Yeah, we'll keep you out of road. That'll have them from you? Yeah, we okay. can have so it'll be daily conversations. <laughs> yeah, I expect you will. Okay. All right, we have a motion on the table. Is there any further discussion? Everybody understand the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Jordan, when you get that ready, will you email it to Todd and I guess to me so I can print it out and sign it? I don't think I have Todd's information, but. Um, all right, I will send it to you. Todd's contact. Okay. Now we've got these other contracts. These are the ones that the road crew uh, the, that the town would enter into with the um, hired road crews, <laughs> with Hutchins and Morgan and all those. What Toby's done is he's just pulled the one that the VLCT uh, template and said that's what we should do. And you can see that it would just be um, writing up the scope of work and the, the payment with each individual. So I don't know, uh, have you looked at this? I haven't had a chance to. Okay. I mean, I assume that you. And this will be even for people that have finished the work? 
like Justin Horgan's done with Bliss Pond now. So would he did, did he do any work following the end of the emergency period, which was, what, two weeks ago? He's been working straight through. So well, this would like pick up like halfway through and... I'm unclear about that one. Okay, I was unclear that with Toby too. So yeah, same with Donnie, you get had stuff starting. He okay. understands it better than anyone. Yep. I don't know that we need a motion on this. That's the contract he would use. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah, yeah. you could probably run it by Sandra for her FEMA eyes. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, well, uh, but all that FEMA requires, no, it's not FEMA, it's the state is now requiring that we um, no longer just do a handshake deal. Right. We have to have a written contract. Well, FEMA requires it too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's, I will just ask somebody to look at it. Yeah, and FEMA actually requires a procurement policy, which I don't want to. Is that the bidding for new projects? Is that what? referencing that the bidding for new, like if there's a post-emergency phase when we enter the next recovery phase, any new project started requires that there's the like a bidding. The procurement policy you know. is a broader thing that basically says the town will seek X amount of bids except for in certain situations and that's okay, so that's thing. yep. So okay. do we have anything like that? No, I believe when you guys shortly after you were elected we talked about an uh, RFP policy. I thought we had one and it turns out we don't have an RFP policy. Is that what you're talking about? I think we, we should probably look into writing one, even if it, it, I think it's better than not having do you, one. But do you want to call the procurement policy? What? Did you, you use the term yeah, procurement Yeah, the procurement policy. policy that's So let me ask the FEMA team about, about what that is. And, and they asked uh, us last week. They asked us if we had one? They asked us what the procurement policy us. is. Okay. <laughs> oh, How about I email Sandra and Scott and Charvet and Great. copy you on it and you can fill the, fill them in, but I'll get the conversation started with the request that yeah. they draft up a procurement policy for FEMA related. A procurement policy for the town. For the town. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So um, I, I guess what's going to happen is Toby is will probably work on these contracts with mm -hmm. each um, group and then come back to us, each firm, and then come back to us to sign them. So hey, we'll. Jennifer. <laughs> we'll see them come back to us at some point. Uh, moving right along. Oh, minutes. Did we, did we get board orders this time? No. Well, no board orders this time. Okay, great. Um, we've got three sets of minutes. Has everybody had a chance to read them, and does anybody want to offer any changes? If so, I'll take a motion to approve them all. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks. Aye. Sorry. Um, now we have, um, you remember last time we wanted to write up conditions in the Larry Orr permit, which we've done. Here it is. And uh, do I, did we authorize me to sign it at the last time, or do we need to vote on that? I think we did think we, because we wanted to see the language. So. so you've all seen it now, and I'll take a motion to authorize me to sign this. So moved. Oh, not this one, sorry. Second. I need the mm -hmm. yours. Uh, we have a move. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, letter acknowledging coefficient of dispersion. Did you all understand that issue? Or do I need do we need an explanation? Do you need Sandra to come back? <laughs> No, I understand. No, I get it. it. I understand. I can explain it. it. Where do you see yeah. that? Sorry, I, it's not coefficient of dispersion. It's really getting late. Um, it's <laughs> it's acknowledgement that we received the letter um, that about our being ordered to do a reappraisal. All right, let's see if I can do this. So um, probably every town in Vermont is in exactly the same boat. Yeah. You all understand the coefficient of dispersion is a, a what they, they do is they compare um, 
what we listed properties for and how, what they sold for. If they're 20% or more off, we're required to do a reappraisal. We already, one of our first acts, as a matter of fact, was to hire and engage somebody in doing a reappraisal. So we're really all set with it. But we are required to sign this letter that says we received their letter telling us we have to do it. Mm -hmm. Even if we've already filed that R RA form 308 that they asked for. So I don't think we even need, I can just sign it because we have received the letter. So I just wanted to bring it up so you all know that that's in the works. John has sent us a copy of the actual form which he sent in a couple of months ago. And, and they've already approved it, so we're all set on that. What about this whole study thing that the legislature was going to do to have um, moved the whole town to statewide? This, they weren't going to start the study until like December. There, it's, you know, it's a long haul process. So the town should just move forward. We should yeah. just move forward. And have we hired someone? Yeah, that was what you. That was your first order of business was to hire a contractor to do the rear facing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we're set on that one. Um, we got Larry Orr's curb cut, and I lost track of my agenda. <laughs> What's next? Well, <laughs> <this is. laughs> I'm too much paper here. Uh, here it is. Oh, I that's all the stuff. So, get that. Um, next meeting. We're still going to have uh, spend a few minutes on select board reports, which shouldn't take long because the collective bargaining team isn't um, ready for us. Well, you are ready for us to go into executive session, but we just received. Yeah, but you guys aren't ready to go into it. <laughs> we don't have it because we haven't seen had a chance yeah. to read it yet. So that shouldn't take very long. Um, so would you like to have the next meeting on the 14th and go back to our regular schedule, or would you prefer to wait two weeks? I, based on where we are, I think we could <laughs> wait two weeks. I don't see anything that we need to meet next week for. Yeah. So my only concern, and it's your decision, is that it's already been two weeks since we did ran uh, accounts payable and you guys did board orders. No, it's all so if you meet next week, it will have been almost a month. If we wait all the way to, if you skip, we're going to have some vendors who are not very happy because we haven't paid them in um, over a month. Can so, we, yeah, I, this gets back to a question I have asked before about e-signing board orders. You, that's going to have to take, you guys are going to have to write a policy or or make some kind of motion to be able to do that. I don't know what the process is for you guys being able to e-sign. Currently, the policy is we have to sign them in an in, open meeting. In, that's right. You have to sign public. them that's in right. public, according right. to the training and went to. Yeah. It's not like you can circulate them among, you know, around Robin and sign them individually and then pass them on to the next person, according to Oh, Anne. that's interesting, because I thought people would sometimes come to the town office to sign them. I will tell you, the, the previous select board used to round robin them and yeah. sign them. If they, somebody would have them at home for a few days and sign them, and then they'd pass them on to the next one, especially during COVID. Right. Especially during COVID, when they were not meeting. And it was only since Ann took that training several months ago that she learned they have to be signed at a public meeting. That's Vermont League of Cities and Towns said that. Okay. So, so I'm, that's I'm a not pretty good argument. Persuade you either way. I just yes, you are. if you wait, <laughs> we're going to have vendors who are going to be a bit upset that they haven't gotten paid in over a And a very anxious Sandra who does not like to be the person paying people late. Yeah. So how do you guys feel about going back to next week and getting back on our regular schedule? And God willing, a shorter meeting because we're having it just one week from now. <laughs> yes, or not. I bet we can. <laughs> And I won't be here. Uh, I can attend by Zoom if necessary. All right. And, um, and my goodness, I, the public hearing went amazingly well. It couldn't have been better. So, I don't know that we'd be able to, I guess we could. We, we could ratify the contract. Yeah. 
We could at the very least go into an executive session and have a conversation about we what could. was circulated. Um, just to just we, we have to because it's uh, because it's not public. It's not a public record yeah. yet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we we could we could potentially ratify it conditionally, I guess, but um, that would not be the preference of. Conditionally, what is that? A condition like uh, on the condition that um, that it gets ratified by the union, but ideally oh. it, it would get ratified by the union. Does that by might the happen for? Well, it's just that the uh, the rep and lawyer are right. gone f this week, and so they won't have time to coordinate likely right. with the road crew until <clears throat> the following right. next week, and so. We wouldn't likely see that coming from them uh, until. But well, I mean, we could well, we well, could just as yeah. easily put it on the agenda for ratification on the agenda for the twenty eighth, and then. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So we'll also likely be ready to propose a plan forward on the Curtis Pond. By then. Act. Terrific. Assuming okay. we can meet this week, which I think. So that's going to sort of make this an extra meeting this month. Um, I hope, I'm really sorry. <laughs> hope Not that's okay. Not your fault, yeah. man. Okay. Modern life is complicated. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it'll be the 14th then, right? Anybody object? Okay. So are you saying, so are we likely having an executive session? <laughs> oh, right. You're not going to be here. Yeah. Oh, that's a good. But I, but if it, but if we're talking about that, I would want to attend by Zoom if I was allowed to. I wouldn't want to do it if you weren't there. Well, um, Zoom is there, right? Is, right? Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, if you are. Well, I guess if it's just us, if it's it, an executive it'll be okay. session. Yeah, yeah. I, we can put it on the agenda as a potential executive session to discuss. But um, in the meantime, if anybody has any specific questions or uh, concerns and wants to uh, just just talk to me, and we can we can talk to them in advance. I mean, there's nothing obligating us to have an executive session. It's just the opportunity for us as a board to discuss the contract in confidence before yeah. it's uh, before it's official. No, I was only hesitating because so. when I tried to zoom into the meeting, I missed about half of it or a third. But if we're just, it's us, just us, we, we would make we sure you were there. And it was doing. And yeah. maybe you would have better luck at the town office. You could do it over there. We could. If that's better. Well, do we you have to. Would it be better there? I have no idea. But we also have to invite everybody to be there, except while for we're the rest at, of the meeting. I guess, yeah, for the rest of the meeting. So we'd all have to go over to the town well, office and then come back. We could just go for executive session. Yeah. I think it. I, I think it'll be okay. I uh, I don't yeah, I don't I know that. So. Oh. Be phone because works great. Yeah. Phone yeah. works great. Maybe phone is even better than Zoom. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's move on to road and bridge standards. Or if, if you've had enough, we can put this off to the next meeting. It, it, no? I think it'd be better to do that. Okay. Except, it won't take did, long. I may have misunderstood. Did I hear somebody say that, I thought it was March, said tonight that you, that you need that to get the additional 10% yes. 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 for FEMA? Yes. Yes. But, but is there a deadline? We were supposed to do it months ago. Yeah, I know. we we sh it won't. I don't think it'll take long. Okay, I'll let's don't do be it. about it for a okay. while today. So if you wait one more week, you're not you're not. We're not going to wait. We're going to do it right now. We're gonna, yeah, no, we're, we're going to do it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Us. Jamie, go <laughs> ahead. I think we can do it quickly. I talked to Toby, um, and our road and bridge standards are in compliance with state standards, and we have to, as a select board sign a document that says that much. Okie dokie. And Toby assures me that it's true. Do we have it such is. a document? <laughs> huh? It is. Yeah. So, and I yeah, think, and do we have that document? And here's what the letter says, if you haven't seen it. Well, I've no, we don't it, have don't that remember. specific document. We, the legislative body, certify that we've reviewed, understand, and comply with the town road and bridge standards passed and adopted by the select board on. And do we know what date? <laughs> oh, that's this. 
No, that's not. That's certifying that they, they were readopted on. Uh, where do I have that? Can we call it? It's, it, I can find out. It would, it'll take me a few minutes. Yeah, we and certainly we can <clears throat> fill that in later. I mean, we right. Yeah. yeah. So then we further certify that our adapted standards do meet or exceed the minimum requirements. We further certify that we further certify that we do have an up-to-date highway network inventory. Oops. We're working on it. Things have happened this summer, you know. Okay, we do, <laughs> and then it's to be signed. It's on it the list with looks all the like by all of us. They were readopted on March twenty third, two thousand fifteen. Okay. Uh, they were readopted earlier than that. They were readopted last year. I believe I put September. one in your Google folder just today. That the I'm one on the website is okay. that day. But the original standard are the ones that they modified wanted to modify too because those did not meet. Okay, it sounds like we need a little more information in order to fill this out, but we could sign it and let Toby fill out the date. Okay. Yeah. Everybody comfortable with that? So I'll take a motion to authorize us to sign this. Sign the Certificate of Compliance for Town, Road, and Bridge Standards and Network Inventory. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So the date today is August 7, 2023. Here you go. Not bad. Jane, look at the meeting minutes from like the early September. I guess I found not on the interwebs. It seems like. Uh, oh. Mine says May 2nd, 2022. Uh, really? So they did it a, a year ago then? It, it was. Was when, it more recent than that? No, when. Uh, so this is the letter. When was Alfie's last day? I don't know. This is, this is a letter that the select year. board signed in 2022, and the date they put on it was May 2nd, 2022. Alfred left at the end of September. So the, the last meeting that Alfie attended, uh, they, but they recertified the. This one is re July re 25th, 2022. Ah, uh, I don't know. Well, it's all right. We can put it in later. Just mm -hmm. sign it and pass it around, and we'll give it to Barbara. And when we get the date, we'll, uh, we'll fix it. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh my God! Um, Curtis Pondam, any oh anything more to report on roads? At the what? What roads? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so everything's fine. It's not very good. Yeah, that one I don't think we're going to do. So Moscow was, no, 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 they're going to, that giant hole is going to be filled like on Wednesday. I can't even, I can't even believe it. They're like, we need that three inch tents. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. But the, and we do need to touch base on that if we all want to gather on Wednesday to chat about this loop on Moscow Woods. Where are you, um, where, say where and when? It would just be at the base, at the base of the dump road where, not on where the road's falling off, but you know, inside where it's at safe. The, at the base, you mean near your Heading office. up to, yeah, heading up dump road by Fellows Road. Yep. Okay. When, um, when, when and where? I mean, Three o'clock, he said, would be good on Wednesday. Okay. And we're all yep. invited. What about a quorum if we do that? Well, can we do it as a special meeting? Oh, I suppose. Does everybody have to be too many people standing on it? I, I am <laughs> traveling on Wednesday. I won't oh, be there. Okay. Jamie, would you, do you want to go? I, I would go, but I don't yeah. have to. It's Jordan, a pain in the neck. You probably wouldn't you be working, right? That's nope. what I'm supposed to be doing, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you don't have a flexible job like me where you can do both. So just two of us, we're okay. That's what I'm trying to find out. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to uh, 
I don't need to. That's yeah, fine. I don't care either. Better, better not. I mean, I'd, I'd like to go, but I, I can't commit to that uh, until, okay. you know, yeah. basically well, tomorrow. So yeah. we wouldn't be able to warn it, I don't think. So. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Let's not. Mm. Yeah, oh, yeah, and just report to us, or one of us. Yeah, if you one of go, us. Will go. Uh, oh, no, no, I don't. I don't want to. I'm actually busy Wednesday. Oh, okay. Uh, then Jamie, one of one of us, us will go. go. And it's Wednesday at what time? Three o'clock. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. So we only have, and then we have a bun closure on single ten past nine thirty one that we're gonna have. Um, a gathering a week from now. Oh, that's going to be, oh, it'll be earlier. It'll be fine. So, um, to re meet with the river, I can never remember Jared, his title, but Jared, Jared the, the stream guy, as I call him, that is not his official title. Rivers engineer. Yes, <laughs> lovely fellow. Um, it's going to come back out again, and they're doing a hydraulic study, and we'll invite the neighbors, and it'll be a big, huge thing. Um, and then the guys are working on Wheeler and Long Meadow, uh, Donnie Mucci. Wait, would you, would you go back to that? What is the when's meeting the with Jared? One? Oh, that's Singleton and the neighbors. So Singleton. And that's when? With the neighbors. That's next Monday. I want to say 3 o'clock. Okay. Um, and is that, let's make sure that only two of us are there or we're going to have to warn it. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, I'm going to be there. Toby's going to be there. Monday the 14th at 3 p.m. We can probably be there, or we can coordinate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I, I don't you, you won't be back. Yeah. And I'm okay with just hearing the report. Yeah. Yeah. And so and Daddy's working on Toby Hill right now because he was already on Martin. That was part of that. They had some huge damage. I mean, I've been super patient. And then migrating back over to Blashley that he's put together twice already. Um, put it back together again, but we're actually getting closer to having most of the rows at least um, not half missing. So, yay. Is there a, we keep getting emails from somebody on... Um, Peckham? No, uh, Bliss Pond <coughs> about the county road end. That uh, I, I put cones up on it today, but it's getting pretty. The the washout's encroaching on the travel lanes. Is that on, on the Bliss radar? Pond. On Bliss Pond, not on the bad end, on the good end. Oh, on the good end. <laughs> yeah, he's not uh, contracted to work on that. And I think he kind of got his big hole. I'll have to go look at, at it point, tomorrow. Somebody should look at that. Yeah. Yeah, because he went up through the washout, but yeah, I'll right. have the guys. Maybe over. it should be in conjunction of working on Long Meadow since it's right across the road. Well, they would yeah, be yeah, tackling. Exactly. We're trying very hard not to move stuff all over yeah. town. So. <laughs> hey, Rose, has uh, Todd started to set up in the pit yet? Um, I was last there Saturday, and he wasn't. And Greg was there yesterday, so unless anything happened today. Oh, OK. Well, did you talk to him last week? I did. Yeah, I said it's a go, and, but I didn't talk to him. I talked to Tammy, his wife, and she said, great. So I'm kind of surprised. I thought he would start yeah. right away. Yeah. Uh, and anything else on roads? We all set there? I think it's so. Okay, great. Curtis Pond Dam, anything else on that? I think so. IT. We've got um, a nice write-up from Tegan making a recommendation about what we should do about CV fiber. Have you all had a chance to look at that? Um, and we've, of course, got the report from David a while ago. Jordan, do you have anything to add? No. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. OK. Just say what the numbers are again, but from what we're paying now to what we'll be paying for CV fiber. So total per month right now is Five seventy three sixty eight for all our phone lines and our internet. We would be switching over to the town office phone lines and all the internet, and we would get up to eight thousand and nine a month. It would be doubling. However, I'm, I get the idea. We can get our other phone lines, the two to the town office 
the two to the town hall and the two to the town garage cheaper if we shop around a little bit or find a different way to do our alarm system. But that has become a deeper hole than I anticipated when I started digging into it, so I am working on that. Okay. Yeah, because for the alarm system, well, it's quite a bit, actually. Excellent. Because you would think, like, like Simply Safe and all these new alarm system technologies, there yeah. would, there would be an expansion of technologies, but I'm well, sure it all, takes a while. They to think cell service, and we don't have the cell service. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm trying to talk to the fire departments, and they're kind of giving me some ideas. Um, but I'm trying to figure out a different way for it to get communicated because they said in the event of a fire, if the internet doesn't work, they want an old-fashioned phone line, phone line for it to work. Yeah. So it's which is an extra two hundred and thirty-two a month. It's, it's a lot of money. Yeah, it's. Does about it count if we have two lines? Like, what duration of time are we expected to be able to have power like generated or something like that? So. Like if we have battery backups. I, uh, I know we have the generator here. I don't know if this is that's related to that, and I don't know. I don't know. Why are you asking that question? Because as long as you have power to the modem, theoretically, you would have you would have external communication. And it doesn't take a lot of power to power a modem. So. But you know, Seacoast just said no. The security people said, if you don't have a regular phone line, we can't do it. We can't mm -hmm. have a fire alarm message. Mm -hmm. And we can look at other security systems, but that, they didn't seem open to negotiating on that front. So do you want to continue gathering information before we finalize this, or do you feel we should move ahead? I think that it holds us up so much that we should move ahead with it. And Us being the office staff. Yeah, the office is Sandra and Barbara and I, or you all, when you're in situations like this and no one can do anything online. One computer at a time? Come on, it's very practical. Exactly, you have to have everyone shut down. <laughs> I had to turn mine off. The so amount of time to waste <laughs> waiting is unbelievable. Um, and if we figure out a way to not have those phone lines and do something different down the line, cool. But I, I think it would really serve us to proceed with this. And I... Consolidated has done some really unprofessional things, from what I gather, and it's just, a, it's also a public show of we have our full support with CV Fiber, we support these guys, they're doing a great job, and we want them to succeed, and I, that counts for a lot, I think. Okay. I also think that there'll be some trade-off in not so much invoicing from RV Tech. We won't be having to call them yeah. every couple of hours and ask for their help to bring us back up <laughs> so that we can get on the server again. Yeah. So between Sanders' wasted time and RV Tech's time, it'll <laughs> it might balance out. So um, so just the savings <laughs> of the treasurer's time yeah. alone would be huge. Yeah. So what is that in, I'm trying to find this, oh here it is, telephone and internet. So they budgeted 5000 for that for the next year. But so. it's all, it's spread out in there. I couldn't actually figure out how it was in the budget and I didn't actually get to talk to Sandra about yeah, it. So alarm, I ended up, alarm might have its own line item. Yeah, Seacoast has its own section, but like Town um, Raj has its own stuff and some things are in under town office. And oh, some I see. Under, so we all. don't know because a thousand a month, that's tw that's that really is a lot more than 5,000. Yes, yeah, so. it's, it's double the, what we're paying now. Yeah. And is that, the, that includes the phone? That includes every, everything. Uh, yeah. Purchase or rental from Waitsfield, I assume? Do we need to repurchase the phones? So uh, if they're going over fiber, it's going to be the void? I don't know. No one has mentioned that in all of my many phone calls yet. So, mm -hmm. you, so you think we'll have to repurchase the phones themselves? Uh, we're in a contract with Consolidated right now. Are they... Well, the only contract we have with Consolidated is on one of the phone lines, I think, to this building. Okay. Everything else is not on a contract. Which means we've been paying a little bit more than we could have, but it means that we can get out of everything yeah. that we need to. Yeah, that's good. That's a little more flexible. Yeah, so I guess if we're mm, changing, changing the... Did the quote come from CV Fiber through, you know, by way of Waitsfield, or was the quote for the phones still 
consolidated or just been, which guess, which quote are you talking about so the quote i put together is all research stuff i did it and then i ran it by i sent it to the guy who called me from whitesville telecom i don't remember his name um and he looked over it and said it matched what he had calculated for our needs given what i was asking for the the <laughs> higher speed connection yeah. at the town office yes um, if the if the lower speed connection is already about a hundred times what you currently have, would it be worth trying to start with the lower speed one? We could we could do that to save that seventy dollars a month, and then if you found it still slowed you down at all, we could bump it up. We could RV Tech encouraged us to go big if we could go big but i i think even if we did just the regular because these are the business mm -hmm. lines um the business internet speeds the ones they're offering to residents are slower than this so we're already being offered the higher level assumption that you've got multiple machines and multiple things happening all at once Great. so uh, yeah we we could go with this the one gig internet T for all T was people. the difference between the lower and higher speed not only in speed but also security no the, the thing that that rb tech emphasized when i talked to them was that there are a lot more security options they can provide if we have better internet there are just things that they can do to keep us safer and to keep a better eye on us that they can't do right now but and, and once we get the better internet they do want to have a conversation with us ideally with all of us about what the doors are opening with their services as far as what they can offer now that we have better internet. Would somebody like to make a motion? I move that we um, switch to CV fiber for phone and internet. Should I ask about the one gig versus two gig, should I do the, them all the same level of connection or do you want to hire one for the town office? And the difference is $70 a month. Is, yeah. yeah. 80. 80. 80. 80. Was that for phone and internet? Yeah. Do you want to add, add, say anything about that in your motion? What was it? Uh, Whether we want to go for, what did you say, the one gig or the, yeah, one gig or the two gig? Yeah. For the town office. For the town What's office, your Jordan. <laughs> They're heavily skewed by my own overcompensation procurement strategy, uh, so I'm trying not to insert those into uh, public finance. <laughs> but I mean, I I think the the one gig would likely be fine until it isn't. And David did say that we can bump it up if we need to. I also think that given the amount of uh, given the amount of resources uh, that we have at the town office that are being accessed uh, by multiple folks remotely, you know, so if John starts working um, and the, the planners and the listers are, are working remotely on their stuff at the same time as Sandra is uh, with their VPN connection, that, that, could, that could bog things down uh, pretty fast but it's only going to happen if they're doing it at exactly the same time. And, yeah, and Wendy's in that mix, too. And Wendy's in that mix, too. So, uh, Well, the difference is Wendy and Sandra can't be in at the same time because they'd be in the same spot, and usually the Lister's busy time ends when the Treasurer's busy time starts. Um, so I don't see so that happening. So if you don't think if there's going to yeah. be a significant overlap, um, then, then I say we could probably get away with just the, just the one gig. And then change it. And then change it for some reason. Now, does, does, this, or right. does this make put us in the cloud, or that's not this yet? No. Okay. And that's not an option at this point. I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Um, so. I, I, I think that we would be part would, of the bigger really RB be, Tech conversation. Yeah, that would probably be part of the RB Tech conversation. Right now, I don't really know how we're running like our backups. Uh, if it's like, um, if we, I doubt we have a virtual server um, because we don't we have do the network to support it. So uh, <laughs> part of what they might propose is that we go to 
a virtually based server um, that would need a better, uh, stronger connection to kind of support that. Um, so I guess technically that would put us in the cloud. But they would um, want a virtual backup. I had a I had an annual meeting um, with them this a week ago. I haven't brought it to you all yet because you have too much on your plate and it wasn't a pressing thing. But he went over all the things that like, once you have better internet, we can talk about this. Once you have better internet, we can talk about that. We can talk about this. So I have a whole list of things in a notebook that's a little more detailed about when and how we can onboard all this new cool stuff that we could access. Uh, and there will be price points associated with all these that again, well, that's why I wanted to bring him in, but hopefully getting past the time of all the flood conversations devoted, you know, all that, when we had time to really talk about it. And so about. where are we with the motion right now? You know, uh, I'd like to leave it open that, you know, if they, if, if she finds some extremely compelling reason to stick with the two gig, then she should stick with that. So I think my motion was to uh, switch phone and internet provider to CB Fiber. Okay. Are you okay with that? Uh, so what happens to, Tegan's going to decide which it should be? Well, the, Under that? well, the presumption was that we were going to start with the lower one. But if she gets oh, a whole bunch more information that that confirms, like she talks to Arby Tech and they're like, here's reasons X, Y, and Z, why you shouldn't right. but take right. the wouldn't you the want motion to... motion could should clarify the one gig at all locations. Yeah. And we're mating next week, so if we if you learn something this week, you can oh, let yeah. us know and we can amend it we next week. We can amend it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so with Steve with one gig at all locations. Rose, what do you got? That's what I found. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got the one gig thing in there. Yeah. All right, do we have a second? I'll second. All in favor. Okay, bye bye. Okay, uh, agenda. Let's see. Okay, I lost my agenda again. Thanks. Um, Motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost. First, then, then you'd better tell me we don't have anything on the shed. Yeah. Okay, and obviously we can't do the collective bargaining right now. So. So there's nothing on the shed thing? No, nothing no, 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 under the shed to report. <laughs> under shed v callus. No. Nothing to report. And under the collective bargaining, uh, we haven't had a chance to review the agreement yet. So we'll put that up. We'll table that until the next meeting. And with that, marathon meeting. Mm -hmm. Three and a half hours. Wow. Uh, let's adjourn. Declare the meeting adjourned.